Welcome back once again to Mises Weekends. I'm your host, Jeff Dice, and this weekend we're talking about the growing and dangerous war on cash. As I'm sure our listeners understand, governments have always hated cash transactions. Cash is private and cash is hard to tax. So as a result, politicians like to trump up phony reasons like drug trafficking and money laundering to win support for laws like the misnamed Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, which makes even small cash transactions potentially reportable to the feds. But today, cash is under attack like never before. Ultra-low interest rates are the norm for commercial bank accounts. And in Europe, as the ECB ventures into negative nominal interest rates, certain banks are threatening to charge customers for even depositing cash. Meanwhile, certain European bonds are now paying negative yields, which effectively turns them into insurance products rather than financial assets. And some economists at Citibank and elsewhere have called for the outright abolition of cash, which shows just how far some people will go in their crazed belief that economic prosperity can be commanded by forcing us to spend rather than to save money. The war on cash is real and it will only intensify, I'm afraid. Here to explain is our own Dr. Joe Salerno, who spoke on the subject at our recent Mises Circle event in Stamford, Connecticut. Stay tuned. In a cloud no bigger than a man's hand, two days ago, it was announced that Greece was doing a number of things. And one of the things that didn't get much attention at all was that it was imposing a surcharge for all cash withdrawals from bank accounts deter citizens from clearing out their accounts. In fact, uh, citizens have uh, withdrawn about 28 billion euros in cash from the fractional reserve banks in Greece in the past few months. So this so-called cash point charge was put in place. Now, what is that? Well, I submit to you that it's just another volley and, a, and an actually potentially significant one in the war against cash, the use of cash. Now the Greeks will have to pay one euro per 1,000 euros that they withdraw, which is, a, what, one-tenth of a percent. It doesn't seem very big, but the principle is extremely big because what they're in effect doing is that they will now allow government to actually break the exchange rate between a dollar of bank deposits and a dollar of currency. Why would they do this? Why would they want to do this? Well, it's one of the anti-cash policies that mainstream economists have vigorously been promoting. So if you fix the par exchange rate, or if you break this fixed par exchange rate between bank deposits and currency, you get the following happening. Under this policy, instead of being able to convert $1 in your checking account into $1 in cash on demand, you will only be able to buy $1 in cash by spending a dollar and one cent or maybe a dollar and ten cents in your bank account. Now, that's a negative 10% rate in some sense. That is to say that, so you would only get, really get 90 cents for every, every dollar that you wanted to withdraw. And that's very significant because this means it'll be more expensive to buy an item with cash than with bank deposits. So let's say the Fed uh, decides to depreciate bank deposits by 10% and you want to purchase a $200 tablet computer. It will cost you $200 if you use, if you go through the banking system, if you use a debit card, a credit card, a check. However, if you want to withdraw cash and buy it, it's going to cost you $200 for the, the item itself. And then let's say another $20, 10% per $100 to withdraw the cash. By the way, if you deposit the cash in the banks, however, in Greece, uh, the, the minister made it very, very clear that you don't get a dollar ten of bank money for every dollar you deposit. No, you don't, you don't. I mean, that's one for one, of course. So that's locking the money in. Now, what does that allow them to do? So if you lose 10% every time you, t you withdraw a dollar in cash, they can lower the interest rate that you get on bank deposits to negative 5%, negative 6%. You still wouldn't withdraw your, your cash from, from the banks. So, of course, this is missed in the mainstream press. This is a cloud no bigger than a man's hand. But I assure you that other governments are watching this experiment. And of course, the Greek government's calling it a, a surcharge, okay, which hides a lot of, of, of evil things, surcharges, government surcharges. So what they're trying to do is to break the parity, the one-to-one -one parity between bank deposits and cash, to lock the cash in the banking system. 
This is just the latest uh, salvo in, in this relentless war against cash payments that are waged by governments, banks, and macroeconomists. Now, the reason given by our rulers for suppressing cash is to keep society safe from terrorists, tax evaders, money launderers, drug cartels, and other villains, real or imagined. The actual aim of the flood of laws restricting or even prohibiting the use of cash is to force the public to make payments through the financial system. This enabled governments to expand their ability to spy on and keep track of their citizens' most private financial dealings in order to mulk their citizens of every last dollar of tax payments that they claim are due. Other reasons for suppressing cash are, one, to prop up the unstable fractional reserve banking system, which is in a state of collapse all over the world, and to give central banks the power to impose negative nominal interest rates. That is, to make you spend money by subtracting money from your bank account for every day you leave it in the bank account and don't spend it. I mean, this is really crazy stuff. So let me just uh, detail a few cases. It all started really with the Bank Secrecy Act of 1970, passed in the U.S., of course, which requires financial institutions in the United States to assist U.S. government agencies to detect and prevent money laundering. Okay, that was the rationale. Specifically, the, the act requires financial institutions to keep records of cash payments of negotiable instruments or purchases of negotiable in instruments and file reports of cash purchases of negotiable in instruments of more than $10,000 as a daily aggregate amount. Of course, this is all sold as a way of tracking criminals and so on. Again, the U.S. government sort of initiated the war on cash on another front. In 1945, up to 45, there were $500 bills, $1,000 bills, $10,000 bills in circulation. There was even a $100,000 bill in the 1930s in which banks um, made clearings between one another. The U.S. government stopped uh, issuing these bills in 1945 and by 1969 had withdrawn all from circulation. So in the guise of fighting organized crime and, and money laundering and so on, what's actually occurred is that they've made a very inconvenient to use cash. $100 bill today has $15.50 worth of purchasing power in 1969 dollars, okay, when they removed the, the last big bills. So they've made it extremely inconvenient to use cash. So more recent events, the U.S. Justice Department just last month, ordered bank employees to snitch to the cops on customers who withdrew $5,000 or more, even though the law says that $10,000 is sort of the limit at which a report has to be made. In a speech, the assistant attorney general urged banks to, quote, alert law enforcement authorities about the problem. The problem is taking back your own money, your own property, so that uh, police can, quote, seize the funds or at least, quote, initiate an investigation even trickled down to the state level. Louisiana, in 2011, in a very little remarked upon law, ordered secondhand dealers, which included garage sales, flea markets, retailers of specialty items, and even goodwill, nonprofit resellers. So what they had to do was they required them, for every transaction a secondhand dealer defined under this law must obtain the seller's personal information, such as their name, address, driver's license number, and license plate. They must also make a detailed description of the items purchased and submit this with the personal identification information of every transaction to the local police authorities through electronic daily reports. This is the state of Louisiana. Even more recently, in April, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network targeted 700, admittedly by them, law-abiding Miami businesses to monitor trade-based, what they call trade-based money laundering schemes. Basically, these were electronics stores. What they were claiming occurred was that these the trade-based money laundering schemes were used by drug cartels, okay, so they would, they would purchase the um, large items with cash from these electronic stores, ship them down to Latin America, and then sell them in, in a money laundering scheme. This order, which will be in effect for 180 days, begins on April 28th, lowers the $10,000 reporting threshold for banks to 3000 for covered businesses. Now, of course, they say it's temporary and it's very limited, but we know what happens to temporary and limited government programs. They become huge and they, and they eat everything up. Failure to comply will result, even in this trial program, in substantial uh, penalties. I might also mention uh, Sweden. The war in cash there has gone probably the furthest, in Scandinavia in general, actually. In Swedish cities, tickets for public buses no longer can be purchased for cash. They must be purchased in advance by a cell phone or text message. So, in other words, via bank accounts. 
the deputy governor of the Swedish Central Bank gloated before his retirement a few years back that cash will survive, quote, like the crocodile, even though it may be forced to see its habitat gradually cut back. And three of the four major Swiss banks combined have forced more than two-thirds of their offices no longer to accept or pay out cash. These uh, three banks want to phase out the annual handling of cash at their branch offices at a very rapid pace. And they've done that since the period 2010-2012. The biggest bank freely admits his bank is working actively to reduce the amount of cash in society. Of course, he argues that the reasons are environment, cost, and security. So in one statement, he says, we ourselves emit 700 tons of carbon dioxide by cash transport. It costs society $11 billion per year, and cash helps robberies everywhere. That's the, the bogus reasoning they give you. Unfortunately, the Swedish public has resisted the trend towards a cashless society, and we're continuing to, to use cash, although now Sweden only has 3% of its transactions in cash. Let me just move on to Norway. There's two interesting stories from Norway I want to just quickly tell you. One, one Norwegian wrote to me about how he fought to protect his right to use cash by invoking his government's own legal tender laws against it. And here's the story in his own words. He said, about a month ago, I had a doctor's appointment at the city's health services emergency ward, which is a government institution. When leaving, I asked to pay cash. I was told that the cashier's desk was closed, that it would be invoiced, and that they generally did not accept cash. I reminded the nurse on duty about legal tender. When I got the notice, I called accounting at the ward. I told the accountant that I wished to pay cash. I was told that was not possible. I asked if she knew about legal tender, referring to the specific legislation. She went completely defensive, as I clearly perceived it. She even claimed that the legal issue uh, with the no-cash arrangement had been dealt with already. I said I would file a, a written complaint. So I did. I called a few days later to check if the complaint had been received, which she could confirm. Now the accountant was apparently more interested in discussing the issue. And then yesterday, I got the written response. I was given the opportunity to pay cash in this one case if I brought the exact amount. Moreover, no changes in the general arrangements would be made. Today I made the payment in cash, unquote. And then here's a second story from Norway, very bizarre. It all started one Saturday morning when um, Jarl Servertsen, a 59-year-old disabled Norwegian man, purchased a PC, TVs, and washing machines for 80,000 kroner, about 13,000 US dollars, which he paid in cash. The store immediately alerted the police, right? They're giving you money and they're, they're alerting the police. So, so the store's receiving money and they're alerting the police, not the other way around, they're not, not being taken away. On Sunday, two officers appeared on Mr. Sivertson's doorstep. Uh, Mr. Sivertson at first feared that something may have happened to his 86-year-old mother, and re who resides in a nursing home, but the police were there with a warrant to search his home, charging that the cash he had spent was money that, quote, came from a criminal offense, unquote. In fact, the money was actually part of an approximately $1, $1 million advance on an inheritance that he was to receive. Mr. Sivertson attempted several times to explain to the officers where the money had come from, and to show them a letter confirming that fact. But they pro proceeded to invade his home, his privacy, and they eventually realized their error and left. Now, the police now admit that they investigated Mr. Severson prior to the warrant being issued and found that he had never been implicated in any criminal activity. They still insist, however, quote, there were reasonable grounds to suspect criminal activity given the sum of information available, unquote. What does that mean? Well, it means simply that he spent a large sum of cash, okay? That was the reason for suspicion. But the police were unre unrepentant and they had the unmitigated goal to lecture law-abiding citizens against carrying large sums of cash on their persons for, uh, for their own safety, okay? Presumably from private thugs, not from police thugs. One station commander said, it is far safer to pay such large amounts with cards than to go with 80,000 kroner in cash on the body. Not because you're risking getting the police at the door, but because it's safer to use the cards. Yeah, right. Okay. You risk getting the police at the door. In France, they tried to pass a law in 2012, which would restrict the use of cash from a maximum of 3,000 euros per exchange to 1,000. The law failed, okay? But then what happened was we had the attack on Charlie Hebdo and, and on a Jewish supermarket. So immediately the state used this as a reason for getting their 1,000 maximum limit, which is 1,000 euros can't even buy a, uh, a used automobile in France. So they got a maximum limit. 
Why? Well, they claim that these attacks were partially financed by cash. They were also partly financed by consumer loans from the you know, capped banks, but that wasn't discussed. What a shock. The terrorists used cash to purchase some of the stuff they needed. No doubt these murderers also wore shoes and clothing and used cell phones and cars during the planning and execution of their mayhem. Why not ban these things? A naked, barefoot terrorist without communications is surely less effective than the fully clothed and equipped one. And yet, French Finance Minister Michael Sapin brazenly stated that it was necessary to fight against the use of cash and anonymity. Cash and anonymity, to fight against anonymity. They want to know everything about everyone. He then announced extreme and despotic measures to further restrict the use of cash by French residents and to spy on and, and pry into their financial affairs. So now, starting in September of this year, French residents will be prohibited from making cash payments of more than 1,000 euros, down from the current limit of 3,000. The limit to foreign tourists will remain at 10,000 euros, down from a current limit of 15,000. French authorities will also have to be notified of any financial freight transfers within the EU exceeding 10,000 euros. That includes shipping checks, prepaid cards, and gold. Finally, Switzerland, okay, the great bastion, former great bastion of economic liberty and financial privacy, they've succumbed under the bare-knuckle tactics of the U.S. government to the war on cash. The Swiss government has banned all cash payments of more than 100,000 francs, about $106,000, including on watches, real estate, precious metals, and cars. This was done under the threat of blacklisting by the Organization of Economic Development. Again, no doubt, with the U.S. pushing for this behind the scenes. Transactions above 100,000 francs will have to be processed through the banking system. The reason is to prevent the catch-all crime, of course, of money laundering. The Swiss finance minister conceded there's no evidence that watches, Swiss watches, are being used to launder money. And yet she defended their inclusion. She said, we just said that if you're proceeding in this manner with property and disallow cash, pur cash purchases to prevent even the appearance of money laundering, then you have to do that for luxury goods as well. Above 100000 it doesn't seem to be common practice to pay in cash. Come again? People that were using cash or, or she admits people were not using watches or any of these other items to, to launder money, but yet they still have to be banned. Italy's following the same policy, and I do want to point out that the, uh, con the very controversial former Prime Minister Berlusconi declared, quote, there's a real danger of crossing over into a fascist police state. Okay, here, here. Recently, the banks on their own initiative have joined the war on cash. Banks are nothing but an arm of the government in all, all countries now. Okay, they are an arm of, of, of the government. And let me just talk about two of the banks. Really, U.S. banks are basically bankrupt. Okay, they're just being kept alive by, by various policies and laws. Because the very, the very existence of cash places the power over fractional reserve banks squarely in the hands of their depositors, which the government wants to get rid of. Remember, depositors can bring even the mightiest bank, Washington Mutual, for example, to its knees literally overnight by their withdrawals. So fractional reserve banks are always one bank run away from extinction because their demand deposit liabilities far exceed the cash they have on hand as reserves. Thus, they're inherently unable to pay off more than a fraction of their debts. That's debts that come due at every single moment. So like the mongoose and the snake, Federal Reserve Banks and cash are natural enemies. Um, banks are therefore um, natural cronies and allies of government, which coddle and protect them for all practical purposes today's fractional reserve banks are an arm of the government and its central bank. As Murray Rothbard has shown, fractional reserve banks from the beginning, from the very beginning, have continually connived to restrict cash payments to their depositors, either by lobbying government for legal suspension of payments to their depositors or by adopting quasi or extra legal means of discouraging withdrawals. Now here are some of the recent illustrations. The Better Than Cash Alliance was initiated and funded by the left-wing Ford Foundation in 2012. Its stated purpose is to, quote, provide expertise in the transition to digital payments to achieve the goals of empowering people and growing emerging economies. What people do they want to empower? The people that, whose cash they're taking away? Such nonsense. A prominently featured on the Alliance's website is a blog entry entitled, quote, Is Cash the Enemy of Financial Inclusion? So they're playing a poverty card. Well, the poor people um, are getting somehow injured by the existence of cash. In addition to the Ford Foundation, the alliance involves the following partners, quote unquote, the U.S. Agency for International Development, number of U.N. agencies, 
The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, credit card companies, that's a surprise, MasterCard and Visa, and the failed and bailed out Citibank, bailed out to the tune of $45 billion. Chase also has recently joined the war in cash. It's the largest bank in the U.S., a subsidiary of J.P. Morgan, Chase, and company, and according to Forbes, the world's third largest public company. It's also a crony capitalist fractional reserve bank, which received $25 billion in bailout loans from the U.S. Treasury. So therefore, it's very surprising to me to see how little notice the rollout of Chase's new anti-cash policy has received. Uh, as of March, Chase began restricting the use of cash in selected markets. The new policy re restricts borrowers from using cash to make payments on credit cards, mortgages, equity lines, and auto loans. Uh, Chase even goes as far as to prohibit the storage of cash in its safe deposit boxes. In a letter to its customers dated April 1, 2015, pertaining to its, quote, updated safe deposit box lease agreement, unquote, one of the highlighted items read, quote, you agree not to store any cash or coins other than those found to have a collectible value. Whether or not this pertains to gold and silver coins with no collectible value is not explained, but of course it, it, it does. As one observer warned, this quote, this policy is unusual, but since Chase is the nation's largest bank, I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more of this in the, this era of sensitivity about funding terrorists and other illegal causes. So get your money out of those safe deposit boxes, your currency, and, and, and probably gold and silver. Even Swiss banks aren't immune to all this. Recently, a Swiss pension fund manager notified his bank of an impending large withdrawal. Now, his fund was getting a negative interest rate. The Swiss have moved into negative interest rate area, Swiss banks, that is. So he was seeking to discharge his fiduciary duty to his clients by withdrawing the cash and putting it in an insured safe. At least he'd have a zero return instead of a negative return. The bank rebuffed the fund manager's request, informing him, quote, we are sorry that within the time period specified, no solution corresponding to your ex expectations could be found. What a bunch of nonsense. I mean, what does that even mean? One Swiss bank expert argues that the bank's action is most definitely not legal because the pension fund holds a site account, which gives the holder the right to withdraw cash on demand. Going beyond that, one Swiss expert points out that the Swiss National Bank may issue these types of directives to the banks in the collective interest of the Swiss economy, but it is not allowed to influence the contract between a bank and a pension fund. In other words, the banks have done this on their own hook denying people the right to withdraw their cash. Let me just end with a note about economists. Okay, macroeconomists have also been, and when I say macroeconomists, I mean every sort of mainstream uh, economist who is more or less a Keynesian, or even before that, more or less a follower of Irving Fisher, who hated the gold standard. They've been campaigning for severe restriction of the use of cash. Why? Well, because they, they've realized that the zero interest rate policy hasn't worked, right? And they realize that quantitative easing policies haven't worked. So what's left? To pay people negative interest rates so that you're forced to spend, so that every day that you leave a dollar in your account is a day that you lose part of that dollar. So how do you, how do you get to this negative nominal interest rate territory? Because people can just pull their cash out and earn zero return rather than the negative return. Well, the way to do that, get rid of cash, which is what they want to do. So, for example, Gregory Mankiw, a big macroeconomist, came up with a scheme. This was 2009. Actually, he, he attributes it to one of his graduate students, and he called it an intellectual exercise. But he, he meant it. I mean, he would love to see this happen. The Fed would announce that a year from the date of the announcement, it intended to pick a numeral from zero to nine out of a hat. All currency with a serial number ending in that numeral would instantly lose status as, as legal tender causing the expected return on holding currency to plummet to minus 10%. So now it's not minus 10% if you're holding currency. This would allow the Fed to reduce the interest rates below zero for a year or even more because people would happily loan money for, say, negative 2% or negative 4%, okay, because that would stop them from losing 10%. This was in the spirit of, uh, of a monetary crank's work, Silvio Giselle, who was a, uh, a, a German e economist and um, uh, the... the uh, the um, finance minister of the Bavarian Red Republic, which lasts for about seven, seven days after World War I. So it's a commie plan, okay? Finally, and most recently, we have William Weider of Weider of Citibank, 
okay? And Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University wanting to go much further and eliminate cash altogether, that is, take all bills out of circulation. Biter said, well, you know, we'll leave $1 and $5 bills in circulation for the poor, okay, so that, who don't have checking accounts. But this is to allow, uh, during financial crisis, interest rates, negative nominal interest rates. And according to William Weider, or Weider he believes that we should have gone to negative 6% during the last crisis. I also want to just read something, ends with something from Rogoff. Who, who wrote an article on this. Uh, uh, he, he's the Harvard professor. He wrote, uh, without going into gory detail, in both the Eurozone and the U.S., there is roughly $4,000 in circulation for every man, woman, and child. And it is not easy to find. By whom? You, the government? In Japan, the figures almost double that. In the U.S. and Japan, more than 75% of currency is held in the largest denomination notes, the $100 bill and the 10,000 yen note. The situation in the Eurozone is different only in that there is a larger range of high denominations, high denomination notes going all the way up to 500 euros. But the basic point is similar. So, so he ties cash in with all illegal activities, right? He, t he tells us in arresting Mexican drug lords, or drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, authorities found more than $200 million in cash. And this was not a first. Well, I bet you they found a lot of expensive cars, swimming pools, and so on. I mean, are we going to ban those too? True, it is, he goes on, it is likely that a significant share, perhaps half of dollars and euros, circulates internationally. Some proportion of this is surely abetting illegal activity and tax evasion. In arresting Joaquin El Chapo Guzman, the Mexican drug law, two months ago, authorities found a room containing more than $200 million, and this was not a first. So, you know, it's crass guilt by association because because bad guys have cash cash must be bad right they're brain damaged then again dollars and euros including large denomination notes are also used for legal purposes oh well thanks for that um, even so there still appears to be a very large share circulating in dom domestic underground uh, economies estimated to be at at least seven to eight percent of gross domestic product for the u.s okay so people like like their cash thank you